Hey, what's up? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Now, have you ever been in the situation where you are thinking about moving to a new room and you've actually got options for two different spaces, right? So maybe you've got two bedrooms that are roughly the same size. Maybe one has a higher ceiling or maybe you've got an option between a bedroom and the basement in your house. So what do you do in those situations? Which room is actually better for your studio to set up your new studio? How do you figure out which one to choose? Do you prioritize dimensions alone or maybe the construction materials, how it's built? or maybe just the ceiling height? Which one of these variables is the deciding factor that makes the room better? These are actually two real world examples that some of my readers asked me about, and I wanna show you how I would make that decision. But first, let me show you a simple way to figure it out for yourself by focusing on what matters most first. Let's have a look. So the first rule of thumb that you can pretty much always follow is that larger is better because basically a larger room gives you more volume and more volume means that you have longer reverb times, which gives you more reverb real estate to work with, if you so will, right? It's much harder to make a large room sound dead just because the reverb time is usually so much longer than it is in a small room, right? I think this is pretty easy to imagine if you think about your small bedroom that is just 10 feet by 12 feet or whatever, and then a large basement with proper solid concrete walls or just proper brick walls, the, the reverb time in there is just gonna be a whole lot longer and that's gonna give you more to work with. But more importantly, a larger room can potentially reduce any issues that you get from standing waves or room modes. So remember that standing waves or room modes are those resonances that form between parallel walls in your room. And obviously the larger that distance is, the longer the wavelength needs to be to fit in between those walls, which means that in larger rooms, standing waves or room modes will form at lower and lower frequencies. And that is actually beneficial. So let's have a look at this example that I mentioned just before, right? So we've got a spare bedroom versus a basement, okay? And I'm gonna use the AMROC room mode calculator for this example. You've probably seen me use this before. Basically what we do is we enter the major dimensions of a room and it calculates at what frequencies you can have standing waves forming in this space and it'll show us where they form on this little frequency graph here, where each line represents a standing wave forming or potentially forming, okay? And what I want you to notice here is with this small spare bedroom with about 12 feet times 10 feet and nine feet ceilings, the first standing wave, the lowest standing wave, forms at about 45 Hertz, okay? And then as we go up in frequency, we get more and more of these standing waves forming and until the point where there are so many of them that you can't really tell them apart anymore. But watch what happens when we increase the size of this space to the size of a basement, right? So this person that wrote in actually had a basement of roughly 44 by 27 feet with 10 feet ceilings. That's a large space, granted, but watch what happens. So the first standing wave now forms at maybe 13 hertz, the next one at 21 hertz, at 25 hertz above that, and maybe 25.5 above that. The first one that really is interesting to us forms at 32 hertz, and all those four below fall in an area of the spectrum that is basically inaudible or that we at least don't use for music. So those first bad standing waves, the ones that usually cause the most issues, are actually outside of the audible range. Those frequencies are not gonna be reproduced by the speakers, so those standing waves will never actually happen. And of course that means we don't have to deal with them, right? So that's a, uh, the advantage we get from increasing the room size. Obviously for this kind of example, we really need a very large space. But the further you go in that direction, the further the standing waves will shift down in frequency and 
the part of the spectrum that interests us, upwards of 25, maybe 30 hertz, already has a, a fairly high density of standing waves. So they're pretty close together. And what we really want is to reach a situation where we have standing waves very narrowly spread because at that point they don't really become an issue anymore. The sound kind of just evens out across them. So that's why it's generally good to go for the larger space. We have that increase in reverb time, which gives us more reverb time to work with, if you will, and will potentially reduce the impact of standing waves, maybe even up to the point where they fall below the audible spectrum. But what if the difference between the two options that you have isn't that large? Let's say, for example, you have two rooms which are roughly the same size, maybe one has a higher ceiling. Now, in that case, if you're working from a square room, a shoebox, I would definitely go for the room that offers a better ratio of dimensions. And I've talked about this quite a lot already. You can watch a video up here that will show you how you can experiment with different dimensions to figure out which one works best. But if neither of them are particularly advantageous, neither of them is really much better than the other, then you can always count on higher ceilings. Okay, so let's have a look at this example where the person had two different spaces available, which were literally pretty much the same length and width, about five meters by three meters, but one had 2 meter 30 ceilings and the other had 2 meter 60 ceilings. So this first one we're looking at has a 2 meter 30 ceiling and that first standing wave sits at 34 hertz which is right in the audible range and a quick glance at the bald area will tell us that the cross isn't in the blob therefore we don't have a really advantageous set or ratio of dimensions. But the same is true for the other room, right? This one has 2 meter 60 ceilings. Again, the first one, the first standing wave sits at around 34 hertz. And a quick glance at the bolt area here tells us that this room isn't much better than the other one. But in this case, the higher ceiling is actually great because we can fit a ton of treatment under there, which can really help with bass control, low end control, if we make our treatment deep enough, right? And with a higher ceiling, we just have that bit, a bit more space 30 centimeters or a foot in this case, which is really advantageous when the room itself really isn't that big all in all. One other thing you can look at is the actual construction of the room. And I'm not talking about the dimensions, but the materials that the walls and ceiling and floor are made from. Ideally, you want them to be symmetrical to your setup, right? So for example, the left and right wall should be the same, basically brick or concrete, or both of them drywall, whatever it is. Ideally, you want them to be the same so they reflect sound in the same way, which gives you a better symmetry in terms of your stereo image. But I wouldn't worry about this too much. At least I wouldn't prioritize it in terms of deciding which room to go for, because in a kind of home studio scenario, there are just things that are more important. For example, that you place your listening position in your room's low end sweet spot, or that you set up your speakers properly so you get that proper stereo image and that balanced sound stage. Now the thing is, what do you do when your room isn't a shoebox? When it's not just a square, but maybe has some sort of odd shaped, an angled wall here, or maybe some sort of like core, little corner there. What do you do in those circumstances? Well, the simple answer is you need to test which room is gonna give you a better low end response at your listening position, which basically just means you need to find the ideal listening position, the low end sweet spot of each room, and then just do a subjective comparison between the two, right? Which one gives you a better starting point in terms of low frequency balance? This isn't something you can calculate or you can predict in any way, you simply have to test it. And a simple way to do that is to use the Bass Hunter technique, which I developed specifically for this purpose. It's basically a simple listening test that you can do in any room within half an hour or an hour, and you can quickly tell which room is gonna give you a better low-end response. And I recommend you do this test anyway in any room that you're setting up in. It's really the first thing you should do when you're setting up a new studio, is figuring out where the room's low-end sweet spot is and 
what kind of balance you can expect, what kind of low frequency balance you can expect to get in that room. So to help you guide you through that process, I've put together a simple guide that you can download at the link in the description for free. Go through the process and figure out for yourself in your actual room, which one is gonna give you the better low end response and what that means in terms of where you need to place your listening position. Once again, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I hope that helped. I'll see you in the next video.